everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hello, Rob. It's Diana. And it's Jackie. Oh, boy. It's an 80s ballad, my name. Do you guys have songs with your name in them? Mine goes, Jackie, Jackie, spend the winter with me. Oh, Jackie, Jackie. What is what is that? I've never heard that song in my life. I can find the author for you. All right. Mine is Dirty Diana by Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. That's not Thanks a great title. And I think that song's canceled. You need to think of a new one. It's Sally Shapiro. Sally Jackie, Jackie. Shapiro. Yeah. Okay. I've never heard of that song. All right. So it's good. It must be nice to have songs after you. But you don't have one, Rob? Rob song? Uh, Rob song. No, I don't think so. There's probably songs with like robbing things, like stealing things in them, but not not with the name. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking take the money and run, but it's not rob and run. I wish, man. 50 Cent has a song called How to Rob. <laughs> how to Rob, you know? But I don't think it's about how it's to be describing you. me. It's like, yo, get a podcast. Talk about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, which is, you know, what I like to do here on this podcast, as well as you both like to do that. Way to bring it back home. Well, you know, we don't just talk about songs named after <laughs> named after ourselves, the eponymous songs. We mostly talk about research related to topics in behavior analysis. And as much as I'd love to continue our song conversation, we're going to switch gears and actually get into the meat of the show and talk about a topic near what and dear to it? our hearts. It is self-monitoring. Neat. Yeah, that's all we're going to say about it, though. Like, self-monitoring. I like the operational definition. It's like, it's a procedure. Yep. Like no one actually really says what it is in any of the articles that we read. They're like, it's, it's a, a procedure. It's a thing you can do. That uh. you can do. I was thinking about how I could like define it mm-hmm. and imagine your morning routine and you write all your morning routine out and all the things you have to do in the morning and you bring a little checklist and then you ensure that you've done all of the things by putting a check mark next mm-hmm. to it. Yes, that would be an example of yeah. self-monitoring. But before we get too much into definitions, let's make sure everyone knows that here on the show, we pick this topic, self-monitoring, and we'll be discussing research articles related to self-monitoring. I'm going to tell you what those are, though. So if you've read them already, or if you're interested in reading them after hearing the discussion, you'll be able to do so. The first article we'll be discussing is self-monitoring during spelling practice, effects on spelling accuracy and on-task behavior of three students diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder by Rafferty Arroyo, Janine, and Wilzinski. That was in Behavior Analysis in Practice 2011. We'll also be discussing an unexpected effect of recording frequency and reactive self-monitoring by Critchfield from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 1999. Then we'll move into Java in 2010 to talk about the effects of self-monitoring on the procedural integrity of a behavioral intervention for young children with developmental disabilities by Plavnik, Ferrari, and Maupin. And then we'll finally be ending with a trip to the past to the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 1979 for effects of self-monitoring and feedback on residential electricity consumption by Winnet, Neal, and Greer. So four articles tonight. They're, they're all what? kind of they're all kind of brief. So sometimes we like to do four then. So why don't we start by talking about self monitoring? I think this topic came up because one of our I don't know if it was a grab bag or it was part of another episode we did where self monitoring as a procedure came up, and I think we sort of talked about ooh we should just talk only about self monitoring because I think it was a component of a study we read and self monitoring was on our mind at the time. So here we are with a full episode. I have no recollection of the conversation you just described. Me that's neither. Cool. Oh, I might I, have just had it and then written a bunch of things down and then it's been like two months and I forgot. Like sometimes that's how it went. Each of us just brings a topic to the table. We're like, mm-hmm. I want to do this one. And I feel like that is what happened with self monitoring. But I also love that I frequently do not remember most conversations that we have. It's okay. <laughs> we have a lot going on. So we started that's recording true. them. Every yeah, week. that's true. <laughs> it's really just for our own. Benefit. <laughs> so that later on when I can't remember things, I can re-listen to myself. <laughs> what was I talking about last week? Yeah. I know we're going to get into these, but I love how diverse these articles are, first of all. So whoever found these articles, Rob doesn't remember that I can't, conversation. I can't, did you find them? Yeah, oh, it was okay. okay. It was me. I uh, could not remember where Jackie. they came from. Jackie these found them all. Oh, I love good. how different they all are, and they all show different ways in which one might use self-monitoring. So I think that that is really, really, really cool. Yeah. And I like that we are bringing up self-monitoring as a topic because it's good to take a moment, I think, to sort of technologically describe self-monitoring and think about how it fits in 
conceptually into our framework so it's not just a bag of tricks type of topic mm-hmm. right but yeah. we're sort of taking a moment to thinking about how does self-monitoring work if it does work and when mm-hmm. would it be appropriate mm-hmm. to use mm-hmm. yeah so when we talk about self-monitoring as much as i'd love to say that it's an incredibly complex procedure that required many many people to develop it at the end of the day it is pretty straightforward Forward. It has yeah. been well researched. I think there's been self monitoring research, uh, at least in uh, since 1979. school journals, yeah, since the 70s. And it really focuses on the idea that when one engages in certain targeted behaviors, that individual records the occurrence or non occurrence of that behavior, or potentially just the number of the occurrence. Which may or may not lead to an increase in performance. Typically, it does. Typically, it does, yeah, but not even, always. Not always, but. For the most part, self-monitoring has been pretty heavily researched and the results have been pretty strong that it is an effective treatment for increasing whatever the target behavior being monitored. There are lots of different ways to do self-monitoring. The example I think we had in a previous episode was a bunch of students who just every five minutes the teacher said, check your form, and they circled that they were or were not on task. I think that's one of the more common self It was self a smiley face, I remember, and it was yep. a smiley face or a frowny face. Mm-hmm. Yes, but it could certainly be more complicated where a student or an individual just sort of notes every time a specific target behavior occurs. Could be some sort of random intervals in which they're recording if a behavior is or is not a target behavior is or is not occurring. Right. So there are a lot of different variations and, you know, one of the sort of hypotheses to why it works has to do with, it was in one of our titles, reactivity. The idea that, well, when we just like with anything, when you pay attention to something, you tend to see it occur more often. Now, that's a huge problem when we're talking about, say, observing someone's natural responses and your presence is causing, you know, reactivity. It's changing how often they're engaging a behavior. But since the purpose of self-monitoring is specifically to increase or potentially decrease the frequency of a behavior or rate of a behavior, that's great. That actually is what you want to see. Right. So we are going to be talking about those four articles. And like Diana was saying, the point of this episode was not just to regurgitate some of the early self-monitoring articles, which would be interesting. But at the same time, they really would be all about children with developmental disabilities engaging in higher rates of schoolwork, really. So we have one of those, and we're going to start with one of those, but we wanted to show all the different ways that self-monitoring has been reviewed in the research. So we're going to be running the gamut from kids in school. To teachers in school. To teachers in school. (laughs) With kids. To kids in swimming pools. (laughs) So many things. To adults at their houses, just hanging out and wasting electricity. (laughs) So why don't we get started? And let's begin with the Rafferty study on self-monitoring during spelling practice. Awesome. I think right. Diana's taking that away. Yeah. Diana, let's talk about spelling practice. Okay. I would be happy to do so. So this was the Rafferty, Arroyo, Janani, and Wilzenski article. And they were looking specifically at using self-monitoring for three individuals, fifth graders, with ADHD and how self-monitoring might have an effect on their on-task behavior and its secondary effect on their actual spelling accuracy. They start things off by giving us some background info on both self-monitoring and on the population that they were interested in. So they said 2 to 18% of children are diagnosed with ADHD. Isn't that the biggest range? There's always such big ranges. I know, I love it. It's like things. everyone but no one. I know. But maybe one maybe person. Maybe one in 50, maybe one in five. <laughs> yeah. Hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one in something. Right, yes. One, between one and one and it's one less, in It's more than zero, but less than 100. <laughs> yeah. But then they noted that of those children who do have a diagnosis, 80% of them have other learning and behavioral challenges that are noteworthy in the educational setting. So this is a population that is in need of some types of behavioral services. And a lot of research is out there saying medication can be beneficial, behavioral intervention can be beneficial. Often a combination of the two is recommended if there are sort of behavioral excesses accompanying the diagnosis that might warrant intervention. So what they were interested in here was using a behavioral intervention, specifically self-monitoring, to look at spelling behavior. And there was a previous study by Harris and colleagues in 2005 that looked at, like, basically this precise question. And they found good results, but there was a couple things that they didn't look at with that study. 
which was they didn't get a chance to actually report on the spelling test performance. So they were really only looking at the on-task portion, which self-monitoring was great for that. But you do kind of wonder, well, did attending better have an effect on what it was supposed to have an effect on, which was their how well they could actually spell. No. It's good to know. It's like, well, self-monitoring increased the attending ability of all these students who still went on to fail the class. Right. And, Wouldn't be that And useful. it's a question then of like, are we teaching form or are we teaching function, mm-hmm. right? Because you could teach someone to look like they're attending to something and self-monitoring could help with that. But if they're not actually attending to it, then they're not going to learn any better. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that they included or they noted that that was something that could be studied further. And then they didn't, in the Harris at all study, they didn't have typical peer data to kind of say what is average level of attending that we might hope for, right? Yep. Which is really important as well because you don't want to be setting some bar that's far higher than what all the children in the class would be expected to adhere to. Mm-hmm. So I think it actually is really important to include those peer normative data to see sort of what we should be shooting for as our ideal range. Mm-hmm. So for this study, they answered those two questions. They said, let's look at self-monitoring again, but let's add in the test results data. And this also includes some normative data as well. So they had three participants in their study with an ADHD diagnosis. That was Craig, Jenny, and Dan. And then they also, for each of them, they did their best to kind of match them with what they called a comparison peer who was the same age, had the same reading level, which didn't have the diagnosis. Sorry, spelling level. And that was John, Kim, and Alan who were matched with the three preceding students. All right. And then they also noted that Craig and Dan were receiving medication for ADHD symptoms, but Jenny was not. Okay. So that was our background there. And they did all of this in the actual classroom. They had the teacher run the program. And then someone else was also there to collect data. But they way that they this worked is Monday through Thursday in the class, in the fifth grade class, there was spelling study time for 15 minutes. Love that. Yep. So it was like perfectly built in that they had 15 minutes a day that they needed to be on task studying their spelling words. So on Monday through Thursday, they had the spelling study time. And then on Friday, they took the test. So it was kind of set up pretty much perfectly, right? And then the students learned this six-step study strategy Say that five times fast. Six up study strategy, six up study strategy is hard. Oh, wow. Really good. Amazing. Super hard. Yeah. Which was the same as the Harris and colleagues study used. So there were like six steps. Oh, yeah. Six steps to the study strategy, (laughs) 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 which were look at the word. Two, close your eyes and spell the word aloud. Three, study the word again. Four, cover the word. Five, write the word three times. Six, check to see if the word is spelled correctly. This seems hard. And writing the word three Mm. times, if you're spelling it wrong, may create an error history. Well, I guess that's true. Mm. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Just kidding. Well, you have to interact with the word in a lot of different ways. I know. If you're studying it, to spell it this way. Yeah. So that's the idea there. So what they were doing was measuring the on-task behavior of all of the students, both our target students and our comparison peers. That's helpful. Mm Mm-hmm. And they defined on-task behavior as doing anything associated with spelling. So they were looking at their spelling list. They were writing on it. They were doing any component of the six-step study strategy. If they were asking the teacher for help, all of those were on-task. And then off-task was like anything that wasn't those things, basically. And the way that they did this, so they had the 15-minute period, and they just alternated between the six students, giving them each a three-second window. So it was a momentary time sample but the observer was always observing someone. It just varied who. Do they have to be engaging it the entire three seconds? If it happened when they watched, then it, then it counted. Then a yes. Yeah. But if they happened and they looked down, it still counted. If they were like looking at the spelling list and then they looked away because it happened during that three seconds, they would have counted. I think it was partial. It, yeah. In that sense, I think it was partial. Right. Interval. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just being, trying to make myself understand. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So... Even though it was only 15 minutes and there were six participants, each of them was observed 50 times, five zero times. Well, three seconds, right? That's not a lot. I know, but like, like, wow, that they got themselves a lot of data. But they were tired after that 15 15 minutes. minutes, I know. Right. And then you also wonder, like, how are they going to keep on track with that? But they had a little pre-recorded beep sound every three seconds that they played in their ear. 
Hmm. And the little audio device. I like that because it's better than the vibrator because then the students may not hear it. No. Right? Yeah. I mean, they, they, I guess, would see you have something in your ear, but that's how they did it. So cool. that's how they stayed on track. Yeah. And then they also were measuring spelling accuracy. That was the percent of words spelled correctly in the weekly spelling test. There were 20 words in the test. Yeah. They did IOA and it was good. I love that. Yep. That's all I wrote down for that. And they did measure some social validity of the teachers and the target students. At the end of the study, basic questions like, what did you think of this? And then for the students, they also asked them, what did you think other kids would think? Since they have a special intervention in place, which I, I'll i mention it again at the end. Sure. I wonder if other nice, kids right? wanted to do it. I don't know. Right? They didn't I mentioned that, yeah. When someone's doing something that I'm not doing, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Maybe that's because right. I'm nosy, but <laughs> I imagine I'm not the only one that's nosy in the it could world. Could happen. So yeah. Good to know. Yeah. So the baseline condition, they had pre-taught them the study strategy, so that was already in place, but there are no other consequences for on or off task behavior. They did that first and foremost, and it was a, I should mention, a multiple baseline comparison across each of those peer dyads with the one child with ADHD and one without. And then baseline levels were you know, quite variable. And then for intervention, they put in the self-monitoring procedure. So first they had to teach the students how to use it. It was pretty simple mm. what they did to teach it, right? So they had the classroom teacher do the training. And I like that part. Oh, yeah. I thought that was good. So the teacher defined and gave examples of what on-task behavior looked like and then defined and gave examples of what off-task behavior looked like. Then the teacher showed the students how to use the self-monitoring card. And then they showed them how to tally on the card when a tone occurred. And that training was considered completed when the student could verbally describe and then demonstrate how to use the self-monitoring card. So they described what the self-monitoring card looked like. It was just they Xeroxed a bunch of pieces of paper and they put on a T-chart on there, which I was like, what's a T-chart? But a T-chart is very basic. It's just like a pro-con list, you know, when you're like, Oh, yeah. trying Should to I buy out, a new car? Trying to find big life decisions. Right? Yes, yep. no, yes, pro, exactly. con. Yeah. So you just like one, the left-hand side is the yes and the right-hand side is the no or vice versa. And you just put a tally mark on each side for whatever needs to be determined. So it was just that type of style, except on the top it said, am I on task? Love that. One side was yes, one side was no. So at each interval, they were teaching the students to check in on their own behavior and tally Yes or no for on task or off task. That's it. Okay. And they also had an auditory cue, which was delivered through headphones. It occurred on average every 40 seconds between 20 and 60 seconds. Mm. It was like the range. Okay. Was there any reinforcement delivered for accurately recording whether you were task on task or off task? Nope. Interesting. That's been found in some of the older research, too, the idea that a lot of times you don't need to do the additional, like, oh, I wonder if they're telling the truth or not. A lot of times just starting to take data on one's own behavior tends to show that increase. In- hmm. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I know. Just bring that up because sometimes I think people think that you have to add it in. You'd think you would want to have that at least to start, but I've seen studies where it's been it's been done and I always been good. I've seen studies where they haven't bothered to do it and the results tend to come out. Pretty positively either way. Which does just make you wonder, like, what's going on? Makes me wonder. I think I think a lot of it is just the simple act of... I like that. Makes one wonder, yeah. a.k.a. <laughs> me. Now that you're paying attention to whatever it is, you will do more of that. Because that's how that works. I don't think there's any sort of really amazing mechanism there. But there might be. It may be actually... There might be some inherent reinforcement being delivered. It's, I mean, it's possible. It could right. be learning so, I mean, history the, of when right. I get the more yeses been, on something, I tend to have something good happen to me after the fact. Yeah, or like the rules have been stated really clearly right. as well at the beginning now, right? Like, sure. This is what I want you to do. Yeah. And now you're going to have a method of, of tracking that. whether you're doing that. So there could be some reinforcement there just knowing like, oh, I'm doing, doing mm-hmm. it, right? I'm doing what my teacher wants me to. I'm following all the rules. Right. So maybe there's a component there. I'm sure we'll talk about that some more. So the results of this were that it worked beautifully. Oh, my gosh. It was gorgeous. The normative peer data were high in both baseline and when their peers were receiving intervention. So nothing really changed for them. But their behavior didn't really warrant intervention. So they remained on task. And their spelling accuracy was high throughout. So the regular classroom 
educational environment was working well for them. For their peers that had the ADHD diagnosis, before the self-monitoring intervention, their data were lower than their peer and more variable. Both their on-task behavior was lower and their spelling accuracy scores were lower. And then once the self-monitoring intervention went into place, we saw nice increases across the board for all of the peers, both in their on-task behavior and in their spelling accuracy, although their on-task behavior remained a little bit lower for them than from their peer that they were being compared to. I think that is okay because it increased, right? So, Oh, yeah. It increased and their scores increased, Right, too. and that's important. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it was a really simple intervention, but that's what the results looked like. So the social validity for the teachers was great. They loved it. They said that they would use it again. And then the students liked the intervention, but one did say he felt a little embarrassed to wear the headphones. So he saw the point of it, and he liked that he was more on task. You know, we could surmise that maybe he felt like he was standing out from the crowd by wearing the headphones. But now he could probably wear the headphones cool in headphones. your ear. So you, wear your- you could do so the many other things. things. Yeah. Right. I know. And this study isn't that old, but like now you could do a Fitbit or you could have your your cool AirPods oh, yeah. in yeah. or something. That There's would be a lot of a cool lot things that you could do. Intrusive. So I think that that might be a point of future research. It's the other point that comes up in most of these studies is like most of these limitations are now actually benefits because of technology hooray Um, so there were a few limitations they brought up they did not try to account for word difficulty for the spelling words across the week so Mm -hmm. it's possible that there could have been some differences there they didn't look at just wearing the headphones alone as an intervention so i mean maybe wearing headphones could like drown out distraction Mm -hmm. in the classroom and improve performance they didn't test that and they also, they taught them the the difference between on-task and off-task as part of this whole procedure, but didn't check to see if that alone would have produced a change in their Smart. behavior, which mm-hmm. right. is a good point, right? Yep. That could have produced a change. And they're like, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> all this time. <laughs> no one ever told me all I these years. Just <laughs> and they didn't try to fade any of these things out. So there was no attempt at, you know removal of the headphones or the auditory prompt or the self-monitoring checklist. Yep. Okay. Which yeah. you may not need to either, right? I mean, potentially. We right? don't, you know, you don't know if once you have done that system, if you perhaps don't need it in right. such a physical mm-hmm. yeah. space anymore. And then the last thing I want to mention is that this was published in Behavior Analysis and Practice in one of the, the early years, and they included a table in the back that was titled Steps to Creating and Implementing a Self-Monitoring Strategy in the Classroom. It has like 10 different steps for a practitioner to follow if they want to set something like this up in their classroom. And I just really loved that. And I feel like it really speaks to the mission of the journal of behavior analysis and practice. It's for practitioners. It's for clinicians. And here is like a pull away point that you can just go, you can skim the article. If you love it, you're like, I could use this. You right. can use those 10 steps. That's great. Yeah. So I just really liked that they added that and thought nice. to do that. So way to go, BAP. Go, go, BAP, go. Yeah. Well, let's continue on with working on self-monitoring with young children or with students. But I want us to change scenes. Picture it. The local pool, 1965. Well, no, more like uh, 2013. 2013. I love that. The local pool. So let's move Old into let's, <laughs> let's move into another article on self-monitoring by Critchfield. And this was looking at the recording not of the sedentary school behavior of spelling, but of the active Work of swimming. As Critchfield kind of notes in his introduction, one of the exciting things about self-monitoring is how effective it can be. But one of the downsides is most of these studies about self-monitoring about student learning to sit and do something, student learning to sit and do something else. What if we use self-monitoring for student moving around a whole bunch and doing something? I love that. I wonder if we see generality to self-monitoring. So that's kind of the the crux of the start of this So easy, study. right? Mm-hmm. So easy. And rather than just pick something simple, he picked some high effort. He called it high effort movement, in which this case, swimming. (laughs) 
So the participants in this study were two competitive preteen swimmers. They were on the swim team and they had their normal swim practice. And he sort of set up a little intervention where after practice, they'd go to this kind of small like lap pool. It was like a smaller pool. And they would just do extra lengths of swimming sort of to see whether they could change how much swimming they did. So it was a pretty short study just with the two participants. You'd have a baseline phase where the children were just told, go into the water. That was it. They just go, <laughs> you know, go underwater, I stand on your head. I wonder how they had just zero laps. Go in, in there the and then see what happens. Maybe they swam for a while. Maybe they sort of just hung around, treaded water, went under, held their breath for as long as they could. Who knows? Then there was these underwater tea parties. Oh, I, yeah, those are fun. Those I still, fun. I still do those, those with the kids sometimes. Didn't involve any laps though. No, that, laps are no fun for swimming. Then they went into an instructions phase where the children went in the water and then they gave them instructions as to what they should do, which was swim as many lengths as you can. So again, pretty straightforward. Swim as many lengths as you can. Then we move into the interesting phase, the self-monitoring phase. Now you might say, how the heck are these kids going to self-monitor while they are swimming? And I also had that question. And it was just very straightforward. At the end of one of the lengths of the pool, so one side of the pool, they had a wax pencil and a waterproof clipboard <laughs> so the students would just swim one side and they'd swim back and then they would make a mark on that board with their wax pencil and in that way they could do self-monitoring of how many lengths of the pool they swam after the session you know so swim as long as you can remember to write down how many lengths you did after that they transfer it to you know an actual individual graph that was next to the pool so the kids could see their results and they, you know, took some time to train the students in all these different procedures, the self-monitoring being the most complex during the first few sessions of the procedure. So we had two participants, Jason and Karen, and they used an alternating treatment design looking at the frequency of lengths swum. I love that. Yeah. Swum is in there. I checked. Yeah, oh, well, it's there. The other piece that was interesting was looking at, is there a difference in how often the participants were asked to self-monitor. So, for example, would they see a really great improvement in how many lengths swum if they were told to self-monitor after every single length? Or would there be any difference if they were told to do every, like, two lengths or four lengths to make make a mark of how much they'd swum? So that kind of was the other little question there. So for Jason, we had him go through baseline, and then he was told, note how many lengths you've swum every two lengths, then four and then just how many at total at the end of your whole session. So at the end of the chunk of time that they are swimming. I'm a swimmer and I frequently forget how many lengths I'm swimming. I'm like, was that 300 or 325? It's usually the numbers you're going for, 300, 325? I'm yarding. I yard Oh, it. yards. Okay. Right? Like I think yards. they were just going back and forth yeah, they and they're just... counting that as one. Oh, I'd still forget. It's like mesmerizing in the pool. It gets hard. Well, especially if you're trying to swim fast. If you're kind of going at an even pace. Because they, they didn't tell the kids swim as fast as you can. They right. just swim as long. Swim as many lengths as but you still, can. still, it's hard. I'm just saying. Yeah. I just went back and forth for a long time. If I'm going fast, yeah, I start running out of breath because you're, you know, you're not, it's not like running even where you get tired, but at the same time, it's, I'm breathing air, which I usually do as opposed to swimming where you're, I'm occasionally not breathing for periods of time. I, I can love swim. Breathing air. Me too. Breathing air is a favorite. I can swim fast for a long time, Rob. Okay. That's fine. I used to be a swimmer, Rob. Well, I swim. <laughs> not much, but <laughs> I do when I can. For Karen, she had a you know, pretty similar procedure, but she was told to self-monitor after two lengths, then four uh, lengths, and that alternated with at the end of the session and every four lengths. So what did we see? Well, in baseline, when the kids were just told to get in a pool, they didn't swim too many lengths. Surprise, surprise. There was some moderate responding during the phase where they were told, swim as many lengths as you can. Though, you know, again, Karen swam a little harder and then sort of went down to her moderate responding. Really only when there was self-monitoring at the end of the whole session did they really see a significant improvement in how many lengths were swum over just swim as many lengths as you can instructions. Which is interesting because, again, you'd think, well, wouldn't more self-monitoring be better? And you have to stop. Well, and again, right? that became one of the questions of why wouldn't more self-monitoring be better? You know, you'd think, well, there's more reactivity, so it should be better, right? But, again... It could be the matter that it took more time to record during their swimming, although it didn't really seem to take the kids much more time to do. And again, it wasn't like less recording had better results than right. more recording. So which is you'd expect to see if, yeah. if that were the, just that, the simple issue of, oh, well, it takes too much time. I mean, it certainly could be an issue if there's like a competing and he does use this. I'm going to put the term in, in quotes, flow of sure. swimming, you're engaging in all these different responses and then sort of doing something unrelated to that response. So, you know, moving your arms, kicking yeah. your feet, breathing. 
could kind of fracture your response units was, was the quote. I didn't think of that great terminology. That was all, all Critchfield there. Could also be a matter of, well, when you stop swimming because you're making a note, could it be that you're distracted? You know, there's some sort of control by the other factors in your environment. So, for example, I'm going to stop and make this mark. Oh, there are my friends. Hi, friends. What are you up to? Yeah, like, I'm doing I this I stopped. Too. And yeah. sometimes yeah. exercising is horrible. Mm -hmm. So when you stop, that's why I can never stop. When I run races, even though I'm tired, I have to like grandma face, like fast walk. Because if I stop, then I'm just going to sit down. Right. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. I'm going to like, especially in the pool. Yeah. So it's possible that really it just came down to more self-monitoring in this case, interrupted the behavior that was occurring yeah. or allowed other distractions from the environment to come into play. And yeah. that's why the results weren't as good. This is also, you know, two young kids doing this extra thing after their swim practice. So it's not it like, just you, know, you, you might see different results if they were doing it during swim practice or if right. it was, you're getting ready for the meet, you know, upcoming. So maybe the amount of self-monitoring would have right. more significant change. But right. at least in this study, Self-monitoring at the end of the phase was the only self-monitoring that really showed an improvement over just, hey, do this thing as much as you can. Makes sense. Yeah. So a little bit different than spelling, certainly both in the <laughs> topography of the response, but also in some of the results that were found. Less may be more in some cases when it comes to self-monitoring. And I think that brings us to a good point to take a little break. And when we get back, we're going to move from the world of working with young students into the world of working with old students, namely adults. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking all about self-monitoring and the variety of ways self-monitoring can be used to improve behavior. But before we get back into our discussion of the research, let's take a quick moment to remind everyone that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to this podcast, you are able to earn one learning credit. Ooh, ah. All you need to do is, well, you know, listen to the rest of this episode and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get C-E-U-S, C-E-U's, and put in some important information about yourself and also two secret code words that we've hidden in this episode. Favorite color. I mean, you know, more relevant, I think, than that. I, unless the, the BACB change, I, I haven't looked. I didn't look at the website this week. Maybe they added shoe size shoe size to, to all the CE certificates. We got to put those now. I don't think so. I'll double check later though. And what were we talking about? Oh yes, code words. Let me give you the first one of those. I really hit it well by going off topic, and it is photograph. P H O T O G R A P H. Photograph. Like, I just took a picture of you, and I will now put it on the wall. It's a framed photograph. Sometimes the photograph's on the dashboard. Yep. It's taken years ago. <laughs> oh, you and R.E.M. Yep, yep. <laughs> Night swimming. Photograph. Now, like I promised before the break, let's talk a little bit about how self-monitoring can be used for us grown-ups. Jackie, why don't you take it away and tell me if self-monitoring could be used, maybe, say, to train adults to do stuff better. 
Yeah. Well, that is where the researchers Plavnik, Ferrari, and Maupin in 2010, those are some great last names, Mm -hmm. looked at whether self-monitoring could improve procedural integrity or not. And Let's hope yes. Let's hope yes. (laughs) One of my favorite things about... This article is they start off with definitions. And I think that all articles should start off with definitions because if you're a student of behavior analysis and you have to go someplace else to get a definition for mm-hmm. something, you know you're not doing it, right? It's already a lot of response effort in learning new things. <laughs> yeah. Why right? add You know you're more? not doing it. So I love that they started this article off by providing a definition of procedural integrity by Najowski in 2008. And they define procedural integrity as the degree to which treatment is implemented as intended. So that's helpful, Mm -hmm. right? Procedural integrity is also known as procedural integrity or treatment integrity, right? Those two things are interchangeable. And previous... Validity. Validity, yep. Previous research suggests that the accurate implementation of behavioral interventions allows us to make decisions about whether treatments are effective or not. And we would want high procedural integrity, I think, in our schools, working one-on-one with our... Or in small groups with our... That's a hot um, take. Think. I think, <laughs> I right? Think. But we don't know, right? Because we haven't looked. Research needs to tell us that. But it does look like if you have higher procedural integrity, you can then decide, is it the treatment that's not effective or is it something else? Mm. Right? If you have low procedural integrity, you don't know if it's because the, the treatment's not being implemented as intended. And so they posit that clinicians need to be trained in behavioral interventions, right? You don't just automatically know how to do them. And you usually need to do more than didactic instruction. Which we've done a lot of. This is the first time hearing of that. Are you sure? Yeah. So this is not surprising what? for us, right? So we usually need a treatment package, role play, modeling, feedback, you know, all that kind of jazz. It does sound familiar. You'd want yeah, to say that right? I'd spent my September's learning some of this, but I, this is all new to me. Yeah. And so they said that with improved procedural integrity, you usually see student problem behavior negatively correlated with the improved procedural integrity. And when I first saw that, I was like, does. For some reason. So this is on page 315. I thought this was a bad thing. I was like, no. Because the negative? Be. This can't be negative, Negative right? masks the correlation. <laughs> and I was like, why would student problem behavior go up when procedural integrity goes up? Literally, it took me like 10 minutes today while I was reading it. You've had a week. You know, it's been, I've a, busy, had a, it's week. been a busy week for you. <laughs> Yep, I fell on my face, if everyone wants to know, and got a bruise. Not, not reading this. Not literally. Yes. No, literally. <laughs> I have a little road rash on my forehead. But yeah, and so they said, oh, so better procedural integrity, better student outcomes. And a lot of, there's been a few, I think, two previous studies that looked at both educator and student responses in a public school setting, which would be important, right? But what they did is they hired an extra person, like an extra researcher to come in. And take that data, but that might not be helpful for a typical public school, right? They don't really have the resources to be like, hey, someone for all of my hundred classes, can you come in here and take this extra data Mm -hmm. on whether or not my teachers are implementing the behavior program successfully? Sounds like you need a grant for that to, yes, to happen. Right. But so they're saying, oh, I love it. How they wrote the intro was like, like the, this is how they discovered it. They're like, but we found self monitoring. <laughs> and that's a procedure that in the past has demonstrated an increase in procedural integrity. And so maybe we could use just self monitoring. Right. Mm. And the other studies did use self monitoring, but they had performance feedback throughout. Right. With that outside researcher. So. We usually don't have that type of luxury, so they wanted to see if they could do it without that. So just train, then give the checklist and see what happens. Love it. But hold the phone. Not only did they measure PI, but they also measure student performance. So I like that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, they're doing it all. It's a twofer. All of it. All of it, all of it. So they used the behavioral program of a token economy. So they wanted to see, would the implement implementation of a token economy, improve with self-monitoring or maintain with self-monitoring, and then they evaluated student readiness after implementation of the procedure, Mm -hmm. and they operationally defined that. So they had three early childhood special educators that participated. One was a teacher, two were paraprofessionals, and they had two students that also participated in the study, and they gathered data 
on the number of token economy components done correctly, of which I cannot give you because the checklist is available from the first author. I wish they'd put that Me in. Me too. Was it just token delivery? Did I'm they not actually sure. get to the hooray you earned your Maybe target we don't amount? Know. Maybe they used the BAP checklist. Right. We don't know. Yeah. So we're not sure. So I don't know what the token economy components were. But if we want to know, we could always email Dr. Plavnik. I'm sure he would send it Step along. Step one. Deliver token. <laughs> You've Step done it. Step two, pat self on back. <laughs> <laughs> and so in order to be considered correct there, they have had to do it in the correct order and as written. So if they did it not as written or in, in an out of order way, then that was incorrect. So that was the DV there. They also measured students' behavior, appropriate sitting and appropriate vocalizing. And in order to be considered like on task, both of those things needed to be occurring simultaneously throughout the entire interval. Hmm. Yeah. So they had a pre-training. So the staff gave a token at the end of this interval following a pre-training baseline, right? If the student was engaging in said responses. So sessions were usually 10 to 15 minutes long between two to three times per week and in both small and group formats. And IOA was not uh, really awesome. There was some lowness in both the teacher PI and the student performance, but not horrible. So it was like 84% to 95%. So it's still up there. And remember, it's done in a public school setting, so there could have been a couple factors. They did say, we know that our IOA isn't really awesome. We had some initial observation issues Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the study. We fixed those, and then it got better. So. That happens sometimes. Thanks for being truthful, right? I think certainly in a setting, too, where it's sort of we have to get to work immediately, there is that reality of you're probably not going to have everything go exactly right the first time. Right. Yeah. And I'm cool with it. I love it when people own up. They're not, they don't like hide it. They're like 84%. They're not like, that's really good. Right. (laughs) I like it when they're like, we know. Right. We know. And I'm like, okay. Hey, man, life happens. What are you going to do do with your IOA? Yeah. So they did a multiple baseline design for both teacher performance and then another multiple baseline design for student performance, too. Right? So Multiple, multiple baseline design. A multiple, multiple multiple baseline design. And that was taken from the DiGirano and Reed article Hmm. that they used as a replication. So they developed the token economy procedure and just ran it as they had throughout the entire school year. So that was the pre-training. So Mm -hmm. I think they already had tokens in there. They were just, do your tokens, do your thing. Right. Wasn't looking good when you look at the graph. Not accurate. That's why it's important to check on these things. Right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not accurate. Then they had a training, and this was similar to previous research where they had two one-hour training sessions. The first was staff only, where they gave a didactic review, modeling, and role play. The second hour was staff and students involved modeling, coaching, and feedback. And once a a staff member hit the 80% criterion, then they were let off to go and do your token economy. Mm-hmm. And so they had to go back to work. And they went back to work <laughs> and kept working. They might have had coffee and donuts sure. this training, though. <laughs> sure. They didn't mention. Yeah. And so then they continued until procedural integrity was stable or if they saw a downward trend. And that's when they implemented the self-staff monitoring or staff self-monitoring. I wrote that wrong. Maybe I do have something wrong with me <laughs> in, in here. So here... In this phase, they explained the checklist. The checklist was the exact same checklist that the experimenter was using. They reviewed the procedures again, answered any questions, gave them the checklist, and then staff could choose any two token sessions of their choice each day to fill out the self-monitoring checklist. But at the end of that session, right, they didn't take two, like, oh, man, 9 a.m., I'm pretty sure that was a good one. Check, 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 check. It's at the end of the session. That's smart. Yeah. And then during the student conditions... <laughs> I know I had one that was 100%. I don't remember <laughs> when, but I know it happened at least twice. <laughs> and I'm going to use those. Yeah. <laughs> and then the student conditions, they just observed the occurrence or non-occurrence of what they call the academic radius. Remember, that was appropriate sitting yep. and appropriate vocalization during all the experimental conditions. And what the graph looks at is the relation between what they call academic readiness and procedural integrity. So the graphs. The first graph shows... Staff performance, and the second graph shows the relation between academic readiness and PI. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty nice graph during pre-training. That's sad news. 
Is that 0%? That's not hmm. good. Not great. Then they did the baseline training, right? So we did see some higher rates of responding at 70 to 80%, 80%. But they had to keep training until they reached 80%. Right. Yep. And then they had implementation of doing the token, right? So that's, that's a big wah, wah. That one's unfortunate for most, right? So especially for Rita, she went down to 0% again. Terry, <laughs> she, she bounced back to 50%, you know, the next session, though. Terry was pretty low, around 30 But then once you see self-monitoring implemented, you do see increased rates for almost everyone. Terry, you see a little one overlapping data point. But overall, you say increased rates for all of the participants. So it appears that for this instance, self-monitoring did help increase procedural integrity of this token economy. And for student behavior, student behavior is a little bit all over the place. But, you know, when self-monitoring is not in place... You see lower academic readiness skills, and then when self-monitoring is in place, you see generally higher academic readiness skills. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. There are probably a lot of other factors right. in play here for the student behavior that were not attempted to you know, be controlled right. within yeah. this study. And that is one of the limitations of the study. Fair. And they wrote that. So I was like, thanks for putting that in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? So the authors posit that self-monitoring may be a helpful tool to increase procedural integrity, and it was relatively easy. Mm-hmm. Right? So they just gave them the checklist, checklist and said, do this. They didn't do anything else. They didn't add, like, a reinforcement system. Right? They just checked it at the end of the day. They showed that these procedures can be done without outside supports, which extends the previous literature, but there isn't long-term data. Right? Right. So we don't know if after using the checklist for a long time, you might see some observer drift, right, or failure to engage in the response because Mm -hmm. it may be slightly a higher response effort than not filling it out. And you did see variability and effectiveness Mm -hmm. overall, so we're not sure why, right? So the researchers suggest that we should do a component analysis, look at maybe more specifically controlling the environment to figure out what other variables could have influenced students' performance. Mm-hmm. That's more about just general oh, yeah. treatment procedures. For example, you have Toby's graph. You really saw Toby's overall performance kind of dropping those last few sessions. But you saw a pretty nice increase in the staff procedural integrity. So while that still could be a component, you know, they weren't 100% right. correct with the usage of the token economy. It does sort of weaken that initial thought of like, well, maybe no one's doing the procedure right. And that's probably why we're not seeing a change in behavior. Right. No, they're doing pretty good. Yeah. And while you might need to be 100% with your token economy to keep Toby's rates of student behavior high, he actually was doing pretty well with some of his attending behavior before procedural integrity even got to 80%. Right. So. Right. But at least now you can eliminate that as a potential yeah. concern. You can mostly, ru- yes, you can mostly yeah. rule out procedural integrity, which is nice. So now it's just your fault. Yeah. You made a crummy treatment. <laughs> one, one thing they did say that one of the students did better when they watched the other student do it. Mm-hmm. So they said that they should probably figure that out. Right. <laughs> too. Uh, they saw behavior increase. Some modeling. Some modeling was happening in vivo. But yeah, so my takeaway in points was use it if you can and then just keep watching to make sure it's still working. That Love sounds Jackie. Good. All right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to go out in the big wide world for our last study here. Oh, I love the wide world. The big wide world. And I want to talk about electricity consumption. Now, as much I dig it, man. You dig it? And now as as much as the treatment your dad's gonna yell at you if you touch the damn thermometer, you know, it seems to historically be considered one of the best ways to minimize Not for use me. of electricity. I don't live with my dad anymore. Oh, uh, wasn't well, it? Yeah, so again, at some point, you know, what's the long term thermostat usage once you're not living with your parents? You know, my parents were divorced, so I don't you know, I, I never had that training when I was a kid. No one ever yelled at me about the thermostat. What what was my electricity use like? So this study decided to say, well, let's figure out what are the most effective ways to reduce electricity consumption, specifically in the 70s in Maryland with moderate income households. So now what they do, which I love, 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 is on your electricity statement, they tell you how you're doing as Mm -hmm. compared to your neighbor's. Oh, I didn't see that on the set. I see ours comes in, and it should be the same ones, but how... We compared from like that time a whole year ago yes. and then everything in between, which we I love. I love seeing that. But then if you look even closer, it tells you how you're doing compared to your neighbors. Oh. We're killing it because we have a solar panel. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's I really ex- awesome. I look through my, my statement a little better. 
But in any case, that's right, Rob. Even though it was the late seventies, there are certain realities to the use of electricity. The more electricity we use, the less resources that you know we'll have long term. The worse the impact on the environment, and a lot of times we use more electricity than we probably need to use. There were many studies back, you know, in the seventies. Again, think about you know oil crisis and yeah. all these shortages, and we're switching to nuclear power. You know, a lot going on back in those tumultuous. 70s. And there had been previous research, so before this study, by Wynette and colleagues looking at, well, if we use feedback and it happens frequently enough, we have seen that residents will decrease the amount of energy consumption by like 10 to 15 percent. That came in a lot of ways. You know, maybe it's feedback on monthly bills, maybe it's feedback on weekly statements. But this was something that, again, was on a sort of written feedback. It didn't always focus on, you know, long-term conservation practices. So they wanted to look at their currently existing technology, which, you know, again, it wasn't a limitation at the time, but looking back on it, there's some limitations that have been resolved by modern technology is can we switch the use of just feedback? Because feedback is very effective. We know this from other studies. However, it is very time consuming and requires input from other people. And I know one of the trends I often see in a lot of studies about ecology and savings and environmental improvement are we put a treatment in place and it was super effective, but it costs a lot of money and we stopped doing it. And when we stopped doing it, everybody hadn't learned to be better people about the environment. So they went back to their old patterns of behavior. So can we come up with an intervention, maybe self-monitoring that sort of allows for longer term change and doesn't require other people to be involved? I think that would sort of be the magic I don't want to say the magic bullet of <laughs> ecological research, but you know what I mean. It would be sort of that perfect storm of ingredients to a good treatment that's long-term and cheap. So one of the ways that you could use self-monitoring with electricity use is, well, we've all got these energy readers here, at least here in, in the United States, energy readers outside our house that anybody, as we'll find out in this study, <laughs> anybody can just come read at any time just that records, right up and our, read your meter. Yep, records our cumulative energy use. Hey, neighbor. Now, I have never actually looked at mine other than to see it and say, ooh, I hope I don't like accidentally hit this and die from being electrocuted right. or so. I don't even know if that's how it works. So many spinny dials. Is it, I look at mine sometimes. It? I'll see numbers. I don't know what they mean. I don't know what the numbers mean either, but yeah. I'll look at it. But guess like, what? It only takes 10 minutes to learn. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that was the question. Well, what if we just taught people to read their meters and then use that information to sort of monitor their energy use? Could we see an improvement? Would we see a reduction from their typical use? If they could use this, this self-monitoring info and specifically, let's do this during the winter time when energy usage is going to be the highest because in any conservation research, it's really important that you're targeting the correct population. So do we have folks that are using high versus low energy? Are we paying attention to the time of year? Because again, we're all going to use much less, well, depending on where you live. No, I was just about to say, yeah. it's not always the case. No, depending on where you live, you may use more electricity in the winter or you may use more electricity in the summertime. Right. And some, some, summertime, some, some, summertime. <laughs> so our participants, like I said, were suburban Marylandians now, I who lived in a townhouse. With this, Rob, because what? is it really Marylandians? I don't know. I feel like it might be Marylandites. Mar Marylanders. I don't know. If you live in Maryland and are listening to this podcast, please write in at abainsidetrack at gmail.com and tell us what is the preferred nomenclature for folks who live in the Maryland state. Thank you. All right. And then I will fix it. I will errata it in a future preview episode, okay? So it was suburban folks who lived in Maryland in a townhouse from January to May of 1978. Many of the people in the study were recruited through a door-to-door -door campaign. They also did some group meetings to discuss the procedures. And as I put in my notes, because it was really bad weather, they didn't all want to go outside. So they had everyone come to them. It's too wet to play. The participants all ranged in age from 25 to 65. They all had about similar income, which again, important information. They used three weeks in January looking at their monitors to have a baseline. And that was sort of their baseline energy use. The mean use was 171 kilowatts per hour, which I'm sure means absolutely nothing to any of you because that number on its own means very little to me. Me neither. I meant to look at my electric bill before we recorded, but I think I had already done that and it's, it is nowhere to be found. It's less than 1.21 gigawatts. gigawatts. Yeah. No, they, no but one was using 1.21 gigawatts. There was no time travel in this study. And that came out to about $205 a month in uh, winter, which was considered high use. It actually sounds pretty expensive. Yeah, if you really adjust expensive. that for inflation, I feel like that's quite high. Yeah, that's to be higher than I think. I don't know. They're crazy. I don't know what's going on in Maryland in the wintertime. Not even that cold. Not know. like here. Right? Not like Not here. Not minus eight. <laughs> 
So all of the folks who said, I'm interested in learning more about energy consumption, I care about the environment, or I want to save money, were randomly assigned to either a feedback group, a self-monitoring group, or just a comparison group. They also, and I know Diana, I, her monocle flew off when she was reading the article the other night. They also she had does have a, monocle. a group yeah. who had not volunteered at all, and they just kind of put them in the study. I guess because it's public information. <laughs> On their meters because they wanted to have a non volunteer comparison group to see if, well, non volunteer, if that I volunteer, right? yeah, right? but if I volunteer for a study saying, I want to save energy, I want to do my part, does that sort of lead to a bias? You know, is, is that enough reactivity that you see a decrease in usage versus the people who are like, I can't be bothered to do anything having to do with energy use? You would oh, expect. No, I, I think it's great that they were included, but it does seem suspect to me that they said, I don't want to be in the study. And they said, that's fine. We'll just monitor. Include your- you in the study. No, <laughs> I don't think they even told them, just I don't want to be in the study wattage. so much as these people never wrote back to us or never came to our info sessions. Still. I'm going to sneak into their yard so, and look at their reader. So what I'm thinking is because these were townhouses, did they must have had permission from the owner of the whole place. Like the townhouse association? Yes, yes. exactly. So then they weren't trespassing on the property. They had permission to be there. So they just... You know, happened Looked. to glance over. They were like, while they oh. were already there yep. oh. and got a reading, but they weren't walking up into people's yards, private property yards. But they did it early they enough in the day. The Maybe they were just hoping nobody noticed. I don't know. Everyone it was seems at work. Weird. <laughs> it was a little strange. So every group, except for the non volunteer group that didn't know they were. <laughs> We're in a study. Got together as a group to discuss what were the purpose of the study, what were the procedures that were going to be used, you know, the feedback group, the self-monitoring group. If you were in one of those two groups, you got literature about thermostat control, you know, probably said something like your dad's going to yell at you. You should keep the thermostat low at like 68. Maybe not the dad part. If you were in the other group, you didn't get much info at all so much as just talking about here's the study we want to do. 68 is very pleasant. I'm fine with 68. That's You get a lot of savings there is is what I'm told. Come to my house. It's much cooler. Really? Yeah, we keep ours around 63. Sometimes I forget to put uh, the heat on at all in our house, and uh, me and the kids are great. And then Diana will come home and go, why did no one turn on the heat? It's freezing in here. And be like, Nobody has noticed or is like, you know, covered in blankets or died of hypothermia. But Diana's very concerned about us. <laughs> she shows her love with yelling. Anyway, so we've got our feedback group. And so every day for 28 consecutive days after this kind of initial meeting talking about the procedures, they would get a feedback sheet at the door. <laughs> like a little, the feedback fairy would come to their house and leave them a little sheet that was color coded with a series of smiley and frowny faces that would correspond to the percent decrease in energy consumption from the, as well as their previous day's consumption in kilowatt hours and that what that total percentage of change in baseline was. I actually went back in the study because I thought I must have been facetious when I wrote my notes and put smiley face and frowny face. Nope. <laughs> They use smiley face and frowny face in this study. The feedback also had a statement about how this relates to their previous statement and sort of generally what their goal was that they'd stated at the meeting for their participants for savings and an estimate of what their monthly bill was going to be in dollars based on the previous day's use. So they were getting a whole bunch of feedback about their Save consumption. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of feedback. I, I my favorite part that. is I would just love some. Yeah, I would love it if someone just occasionally left me a piece of paper and like, here's all the ways you're doing stuff. And here's how close you are to your goal. Ooh, here's how far you are from your goal. And then use that information every day. I would love that group. That seems like the most expensive group. I would just want my savings to be listed in Starbucks. Like you earned one coffee. Oh, well, social validity of this this plan is, is going to come into play later. You've saved two coffees. I think there was a Starbucks, but probably not in Maryland in 1978, so it would not have not have worked. I also wasn't in Maryland in 1978. No. I wasn't even alive in 1978. I don't think any of us were. were. I know. <laughs> so, now let's talk about the self-monitoring group, which is the most important group as far as the audience and as far as we are consent. concerned. They also gave consent. So, they had their group. They had kind of the same format overall. We're going to be looking at the next 28 consecutive days after this meeting of your usage, except they got additional training in how to read the electricity meter. It was 10 minutes of instruction, and then they took a quiz, and they had to pass the quiz, and everybody passed. Hooray! They would get a big pack of meter forms. They had four weekly meter forms that they were given. So they're given different stacks every week that had a picture of the meter dial. So they'd go outside, they'd read the meter, they'd mark on the picture where the dial was, I'm glad they didn't try to make us learn how to read a meter in this article because it was already a little bit long and I don't know how to do that and it scared me. Then they'd mark the position, then they'd go back inside their house and they'd interpret what that meant. 
Then using that information. Winter. Yeah, it was way out in the winter. I know. I was they expecting a lot more people dropping out when they realized, I gotta go outside. And well, it's in Maryland. It's below the Mason-Dixon line. That's true. So once they were inside, they had kind of the, a worksheet on the, all the forms they were given. So they could calculate the kilowatt hour difference from the previous day. They had a space in which they could graph their results. They could compare with their baseline use and compare to their reduction, their overall reduction goal. There was a staff member who did the very first day reading so that the participants all had something to compare to that first day. They also got a nice telephone call to see how things were going that first day. And then they had a carbon copy. Remember carbon copies, folks? For money, you probably don't know what that means. It's like a Xerox. I still use In them. In triplicate. In triplicate. No, I just one copy. I still use those. When? When I signed my house forms. Oh, yeah. There are very few times people use carbon copy. But the researchers would get kind of a carbon copy of the form each week. And then every week they'd get a note about how accurate their responding was. The recording was, I should say. And it was all very good. They did fine. So that's not really that important for the study. Then they would get a note. You know, they'd get kind of similar to the feedback group. They'd get a note showing their expected use for the prior day in terms of the percentage used. This was less about feedback, though, and more to kind of take into account the fact that the weather changed every day. So, again, the amount like that kind of quote unquote should be used was going to vary from day to day. I was very impressed by this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is like not a fly by night operation here. They had some math. Yeah. In this study. But they needed this form. So it wasn't exactly feedback. They needed this information so they could do the final calculation, which was, what's my percent change from my original baseline use? Because that's what's important is, how am I changing my behavior in terms of total electricity use? All right. They had Uh, a formula, too, to figure out if people were out of town. Yes. Right? They could look at the at the meter and if it was, you know, really, really low or yeah, nothing had like been used. Yeah, like 50% of the normal level. Then they- the staff member would read all the meters at the same time. So somebody's job for an entire month was to walk the whole group of townhouses and read all the meters to get kilowatt per I hour love use. That. I'll take that as a job. Yeah. I mean, yeah, not bad. I mean, some grad student or one of the researchers, you know, had to do all this. So we've got our groups. And then the comparison group, they just got information. You know, they didn't even get any information. I don't think they got anything. They just were told, we'll call you later. And the non-volunteer group wasn't even told they were in a study. Surprise. So a lot of the results use statistics. They used Econova. They used some T-tests. But we're just going to generally talk about significance of the results. So in baseline, we've got our four different groups. We've got our feedback group, our self-monitoring group, our comparison group, and our non-volunteer comparison group. And there was no significant difference in kilowatt per hour usage across any of the groups. Though the non-volunteer comparison groups, just a little dig for those folks, used more kilowatt hours per household in general. Because they don't care. Because they don't care. They don't even want to be in a study, those <laughs> jerks. They don't Maybe care about really anything. Busy people. There's no excuse, Diana. You need to make time for the environment. Earth Day had been invented recently, I think, sometime <laughs> in the 70s, right? <laughs> so during the intervention itself, the feedback and self-monitoring groups were consistently below the comparison groups and therefore also the non-volunteer comparison groups. I'm going to kind of chunk them together after this. The feedback group actually did have lower usage than the self-monitoring group. And this was the same pattern when they did four week and six weeks follow up. So they're kind of looking to see, did anyone continue on with that trend of using less electricity? So there was a significant difference in the household use for the feedback groups versus the comparison groups uh, or the self-monitoring groups. So feedback group was, you know, the quote unquote best groups. They had the best results. Self-monitoring group also differed from the comparison group. So they also had lower uh, reduction in kilowatt per hour group. The feedback group showed about a 13% reduction in our energy consumption. Self-monitoring was about 7%. There was a follow-up, uh, that first follow-up, the four-week follow-up. They had pretty similar results, but by the second follow-up, there really weren't significant differences between the groups anymore. However, there was still a general reduction in usage from the feedback and treatment groups. There's also the confound of at the end of the study, it was a lot warmer. So it potentially was just no one was using that much electricity because no one had their heat on. The actual environment had changed enough around folks that the total use of electricity might have, you know, might have might have hit a basement or hit, you know, hit a kind of ceiling of use, I should say. They didn't like anticipate that? I think they knew it. It's just that's what happened. Weather changes and you can't necessarily predict it to that extent. So you oh, do what snap. you can. Oh, Weather Damn. changes. Yeah, there's my hot take. Weather changes. They were like, dear planet Earth, please remain consistent for the next I need months. a control for the study I'm doing. <laughs> dear Mother Earth, make it colder now so we can see if it worked. Huh. Now make it hotter. So when you look at the individual house usage of, of electricity, 65% of the comparison group uh, at the end of the study, used more than 90% of their baseline meat. So they had like absolutely no reduction, if not actually an increase in electricity in some cases. 
However, with the self-monitoring group and the feedback group, you saw only 16% ended up using, you know, pretty much about the same as they used in baseline or around the same as they used in baseline. The feedback group, nobody used the same amount. They all showed a reduction compared to their baseline. In terms of dollar savings, the self-monitoring houses were saving about $11 per month. The feedback group, about $23 per month. So again, you kind of see that pattern again and again. There was a lot of agreement, 96% of agreement for the researcher with the folks doing self-monitoring, but there was a sad fact, only 50% of the self-monitoring group ever bothered to make a graph on their little sheets. Sad. <laughs> they just don't have the same appreciation, perhaps, for visual inspection of data. Uh, not everybody that does. We might. I know. We just had more exposure. So when you look at social validity, because that's important, because again, we saw a reduction in usage for self-monitoring group. We saw a reduction for the feedback group. Nine out of 11 of the participants preferred kilowatt app per hour feedback to the price feedback. So they actually like seeing how much usage they were versus how much money they saved. Which but, but they didn't try out the Starbucks feedback. No, they did not try so that one out. Future research. Daily feedback group kind of liked the study better than the self-monitoring group. But you know, overall, everyone liked it pretty, pretty well. And, of course, we learned the important lesson that just volunteering to do a study about something and then getting no treatment typically does not change your behavior. <laughs> Surprise! Some of the questions here on an episode all about self-monitoring, it sounds like self-monitoring is not always the best option to use. And that's played out a little bit here. Feedback was more effective. It might be the fact that self-monitoring group, there was a lot more response effort. The mm -hmm. feedback group just looked at what the results from their feedback were and could change or not change their behavior. self minor group had to do a lot of extra work first before being able to determine if they were on track to have the target decrease in kilowatt hour per hour usage. Again, a lot of the barriers to, to using some of these, either of these treatments have really gone down. You know, for, so for example, you think about feedback, the idea of someone coming to your house and giving you feedback paper every day, that sounds like a plan no one is going to support long term. <laughs> <laughs> I but, love that. But nowadays, think how easy it would be to just have your electric company send you an email or a text message every week or every day, sort of giving you that information. If you, if you opted into like, I want to be in a, the savings club or whatever. So there are a lot of ways that you could probably make feedback more efficient than self-monitoring. I mean, I think self-monitoring is nice in that you then get to learn how to use your reader, but it are, is, is a number of more steps. There also is the reality of uh, nobody made their graph. Would the graph have actually been helpful if they'd been trained into using the graph more or if they'd been expected to use the graph more? Because, I mean, I think most people are pretty visual learners. I'm just looking at numbers of kilowatt hours. That doesn't necessarily tell me that much information other than this number is bigger, this number is lower. So that certainly could be. The also the issue, the limitation they bring up is that there are a lot of areas in the country where electricity stays pretty cheap. So even if you do put some of these treatments in place, folks might not see the reduction or see any sort of savings through reducing their usage of electricity, in which case, why would they continue to engage in, you know, novel behavior to try to, re you know, reduce their, their usage? And, and that can be true. So self-monitoring was better than doing nothing, but it wasn't quite as good as feedback. So interesting, interesting. And with that, we've come to the end of our articles on self-monitoring. So that means we're going to move into dissemination station. So Jackie checks her form. It says, did Rob say something about dissemination station? Check. Did I make a train noise? Check. Did Diana deliver the token economy? Check. Good job, everybody. Oh, good. There we go. Did I uh, drink tea? Check. There we go. We're ready for dissemination station. So when we talk about self-monitoring, we've got a lot of really positive results in the literature and not just in these four studies. We've read a number of other studies, too, that point to self-monitoring being a very effective treatment. It also is very easy, easy to do. <laughs> so easy. Unless the one time I imagine self-monitoring not being easy is if you have not clearly defined what you are monitoring. Yes. Fair. Right? So I can imagine someone hastily putting together a self-monitoring sheet mm -hmm. without being like, oh, do it because it's easy. But if it's not easy for everyone, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's one caveat you have to think about mm -hmm. is that you can't add your words to a sheet that's not meant for you. <laughs> right. Like yeah. if not everyone has the same language. You can't use the word manned intact mm -hmm. if no one's ever heard the word manned intact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think even in situations where we might find that, you know, like with the electricity study, that potentially feedback is more effective. Even I think in the, the Plavnik study, the feedback during the training usually led to, I think, quicker percentage uh, correct steps in the staff. So feedback 
potentially is the better alternative if you have a choice. But the issue with feedback is you now need another person involved. Feedback can't be delivered as regularly as, say, the use of a self-monitoring form. So when we're looking to improve independence as well as change behavior in a certain direction, self-monitoring may be, you know, could it be more effective long term? And that I actually don't know if there have been that many studies on the use of self-monitoring over a long period of time. I mean, some of these had follow-ups and we certainly saw some continued successes over the period of time. But is there a significant decrease between the two? What are the cost savings? What's the return on investment from using feedback on a regular basis versus self-monitoring on a regular basis? But I also think there may be times where feedback could be aversive to receive, Mm -hmm. right? So because when you're getting feedback, there's almost always kind of a power dynamic at play there Mm -hmm. where someone else is telling you what you should be doing. And I could see how, depending on the situation, you could develop some counter control toward that and Mm -hmm. actually not want to do Mm -hmm. what the person says anymore. Because sort of the key here that I don't think we've touched on, but I was thinking about as we were talking is it's implied whenever you're using self-monitoring that the behavior to be changed is also going to function as a reinforcer. Yes. For that individual. All the yes. Mm-hmm. Right? right. All the yeses there. Yeah. And so if that's not the case, then doing the whole self-monitoring activity and seeing your own behavior change and receiving that feedback isn't going to function as a reinforcer. And then you're going to stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because so, it's going to be more responses than you need to make in your life. Exactly. And you mm-hmm. don't care about the outcome. Sure. Right. So self-monitoring is only going to work when the end goal is going to function as a reinforcer Mm -hmm. for that person. Whereas feedback may work in multiple contexts because feedback can have either a punishing or reinforcing quality to it, depending on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. I'd also love to see more in terms of self-monitoring as a component of other treatments. And in the Critchfield study mentioned self-monitoring is often used in addition to other, you know, treatments components Mm -hmm. with a token economy reinforcement. And with that, looking at sort of how is self-monitoring phrased, because if you use self-monitoring, and the idea is, well, it's a lot of your activity. If you had some sort of component of, I need you to note the number of times you did something wrong, and I want you to have that number of times be below some sort of a threshold, right. as much as I would hate to put that treatment in place because it's so darn, sounds so aversive on its own, would it still affect behavior with a similar pattern as you'd see when it's you're recording what you're doing correct? And I mean, I don't know why you would necessarily want to do one, but why you'd want to look at like doing something incorrect, but you know, would it have that same pattern of responding that we're seeing with note every time you do the correct thing? Like every time you missed doing something, would that still have a similar change in behavior? It would make me sad. It would be. I don't like being sad, so I probably wouldn't want to do it anymore. Okay. Yeah, me neither. I'm, I'm, that, was, that was more just as a curiosity, which again is not a great reason to do research, but I was just thinking about <laughs> but it. But it is. exactly the reason to That's do research. That's why you uh, do research, Rob. Well, no, well, but it's a cur- socially significant curiosity. Right. Yeah. That's how you do applied research. Right. Mm -hmm. But basic research, if you're just curious about something and it's not there, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag, if you got time, just do it. But that's why, like... (laughs) Hashtag, that's a very long hashtag. It's very long. If you got time, just do it. I think the Nike company would not appreciate (laughs) just do it being put... Well, actually, maybe they wouldn't care. Just do it. Just gets a brand awareness. Dear Nike. Yeah. Any other thoughts on self-monitoring? I think we covered it. I yeah. think it's fun and helpful. It's a low resource yes. intervention. Yes. can be quite effective. can put some autonomy in the hands of the person looking to change their own behavior, mm-hmm. which I also oh, like. Yes, yes, Diana. Thanks. So it's always worth a shot. Yeah. Definitely does not seem like a procedure that would cause any real, <laughs> real harm. At worst, it just might not be as effective as something else, but... We don't always have to be 100% effective in our treatments. A lot of Xerox copies did happen in these studies. That's true. To create the self-monitoring chart. So I would put that out there as a potential downside. Yeah, you could do it on your phone if you're trying to be carbon-free. I think that would be a good idea. Well, that brings us to the end of our talk about self-monitoring, which brings us to the end of our episode. No! I'm sorry, it's time to go. But before we wrap everything up, I want to make sure to give you that second secret code word, and it is... Fishnet, F I S H N E T. Tis a net for catching fish. You know, out on the ocean, you get mackerel. Remember Aquanet? Aquanet. The hairspray? Yeah. yeah. You remember it. I know, yeah. But that's not the code word. It's 
fishnet. All right, I'm going to get my self-monitoring checklist for the end of the episode stuff out. Here we go. Okay, let's see if I get you it all. I actually need one. I do need one. I do need <laughs> one. That's very true. I want to certainly thank both of you for being here. I want to thank all of our listeners very much for listening to ABA Inside Track. If you like the podcast, why not think about subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts? Please, we would love to hear from you, either as a review on any of those podcast forums or on our social media sites. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram as ABA Inside Track. You can also find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. You can feel free to leave comments there as well. And hey, you really got nowhere else to be. Why don't you check out the ABA Inside Track webpage at abainsidetrack.com where you can find links to many of these articles as well as links to purchase CEs for listening to our episodes. And of course, we always love hearing from you with the old email at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Some final thank yous. I want to say a big thanks to Jim Carr for our intro and outro music, to Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, to Hollis Irvin from the Sycamore Workshop for many of our logo designs and visuals, and to Dan Thabit of Liquid Studio Podcast Editing. Well, that brings us to the final seconds of the show, but don't worry, we'll be back next week with another full-length research episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye, 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 bye.